Welcome back to lecture 12. This is the fourth video and last. So lecture 12D. We just finished um, looking at the first two of Paul's prison letters, the letter to the Philippians and the letter to Philemon. I forgot to mention that um, we can't accurately date these letters because we're not sure which prison visit um, it was that he wrote these letters during. So it could have been in Caesarea, which would have been earlier, 56 to 58 or so. Um, it could have been in his Roman imprisonment, which would have been in the 60s most likely. Um, and we're not sure if he was in prison in Ephesus, but some people suggest that. So we're not exactly sure, but we do know he's in prison because he identifies himself as writing from prison throughout these. So the other two prison letters um, are Colossians, written to the church at Colossae, which was a small um, city really. Um, what was interesting about Colossae is there were a lot of different religious ideas floating around there. And so Christians were getting a little confused. <laughs> And what they were doing is getting caught up in what we call syncretism. Um, there was a syncretistic um, environment there, which means there are um, a mixture of all different religious ideas. Um, and some of those ideas were actually contrary to what um, Christ taught. And so to have all those mixtures of beliefs uh, were, was very confusing for the Colossians. And so Paul writes um, Colossians in order to encourage these Christians. And he basically says, uh, Christ is the Lord of all the universe. So if you are trying to pursue things like magic um, or mystery religions, mystery cults, um, because you think that these are outside of the domain of God, um, then, you, then you really should realize that Christ is the Lord of everything, that you worship Christ um, and that's the greatest mystery of all, that the fact that God has come to earth as a human being. And so it's a, it's a really um, important, uh, sort of exciting letter about how to deal with um, people in a culture that have many different religious beliefs together. Ephesians um, was his last uh, prison letter. And this was not probably written just to the church at Ephesus, though it says Ephesians on it. Most likely it was a circular letter, which means that it was written to several different churches in the same area. And it would be sent to one and they would read it. Then they would pass it on to the next one. And that church would read it. And so this is what we think happens with this letter to the Ephesians. Um, in it, Paul focuses on unity um, between Jews and Gentiles. And he wants to reiterate the fact that um, people are saved through the grace of God and through their faith, not through the things that they do. They can't earn a salvation um, that God has already provided that, that free gift. But there are some inter other interesting passages in Ephesians, and I want to look at one. Um, I'm actually going to put it up on the screen here so you can look at it because it is a passage that has been discussed and argued about uh, and disagreed upon for many many years um, and and there are some very um, pervasive beliefs of the church that are based on this passage and so I thought well we should look at it um, and I can give you a perspective on it um, that maybe you haven't heard before so this passage is um, Ephesians 5 21 through 33 and we're gonna look at it I'm gonna read it and then I want you to be thinking uh, what do you think it meant to the people who were first hearing it what did that mean in their context um, and then to ask what is the new teaching here this is a really good question to ask of any passage that you're reading, um, what is Paul saying or what is Jesus saying or whatever that is new to these people? Because this is the probably the most important part of a passage, what is new. So here we go. Um, this is near the end of Ephesians um, and he starts, we call this the household codes um, and there are many household codes um, in the Roman Empire. I've talked about it before. You know, the pater familias is the head of the household and has, you know, power of life and death over everyone. Well, this is Paul's version of um, the household code and I want you to, to figure out what is a little different um, than maybe the Greco-Roman world would have said. So he starts out, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, and there's no verb there, to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind, Yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own body, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, 
because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I'm applying it to Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and a wife should respect her husband. Okay. So this passage for many, many years has been um, used to defend the model of a household, even in the contemporary world, that, that man is the head of the household or man is the spiritual leader or something like that, right? Um, the problem with that is that that is really not the main point of this passage. Uh, yes, it is setting up a um, version of a household code for the first century, Um and so the whole submitting, wives submitting, and things like that, completely normal for this time period. Um, the reason that I highlighted that there's no verb in this um, verse 22 uh, is because there are many versions of the Bible that actually start the section, you know, the section headings of Bibles are put in way later, just in, in the last, you know, 50 years or so. Um, and so what some will do is not put that verse 21, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ with the rest of the passage. They will put it with the passage before, and then they'll start this, this whole section with wives submit to your husbands um, or be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. Problem is, since there's no verb there in verse 22, it has to connect to the verse 21. It gets the verb from verse 21. So you can't split those two apart. Um, and if you do split those two apart, you really miss the main idea of this section, which is be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Um, very different than what the Romans would have told the Paterfamilius. Um, the Paterfamilius was subject to no one except for maybe the emperor. But here, Paul is saying, be subject to one another. It's that same thing we looked at in 1 Corinthians. Paul is kind of leveling the playing field a little bit here. Um, so it's not surprising to see, oh, wives, you need to submit. Yes, that is exactly what the whole culture did already. But then he has this huge section telling husbands what to do. Um, and again, that does not happen in the Roman world. Husbands are not told what to do ever, but Paul does tell them what to do. You have to love your wives, he says. Um, and that was not something that was required in their society. You know, husbands married um, women um, because of the families that they were part of, and they married women um, to have children with them, but then they would have have other affairs and things like that and it was not a problem um, but here Paul is saying again marriage is different in the church than it is in the society um, husbands need to love their wives there needs to be a, a, a relationship of mutual love um, and they need to be able to give themselves up for for their wife just like Christ did for the church and so that's really the main point here um, and so to take it out of context and say oh this sets it up for the way that the the church should work forever and the way that family should work forever is, is kind of short-sighted. Um, and so I really think the main idea here is he's trying to pull away from the Roman idea of family and create a new idea of Christian family. And that involves people being submissive to one another um, just as they are submissive to Christ. Um, but, you know, we have room in the Christian church for a disagreement on this. There are many Christians who say this is the way that uh, marriages have to be uh, for all time. And then there are some who say this is not the way it needs to be. There can be an egalitarian model of marriage where um, the wife and the husband have equal roles and they um, participate in the roles in marriage depending on what their gifts are, not depending on their gender. And so that's the kind of marriage that my husband and I have. Um, and we believe that we are still in God's will and everything. We interpret this passage as being um, a way of, of trajectory, I guess you can call it, um, out of the old way of families, um, which what the Roman Empire had established, um, and into a new way of family, a marriage um, that involves um, equal love and equal submission, or what we call mutual submission to one another. So I thought that would be an interesting passage for us to look at. Um, we need to keep on going so we can finish this video. So Romans is probably one of um, Paul's most famous letters. Um, it ends up being his most theological, and what that means is that he lays out his beliefs a little more clearly here than he does in other letters because he is writing to a church that he had never visited before. He had not been to the church in Rome. He had not founded the church in Rome. Um, and so he has to sort of lay out what it is that he wants to make sure that they know about the gospel. Um, and so he writes this we're not exactly sure when, um, but maybe 55, 56. He, he introduces himself to the church. Um, he introduces the gospel to the church. And he actually, interestingly enough, provides a letter of recommendation for a woman named Phoebe. Um, this is how 
people became leaders in churches, they would get a letter of recommendation from one church to go to another church. And it seems like Phoebe was a deacon at the church at Kencray, and Paul had worked with her. And so he, at the very end of Romans, gives a letter of recommendation for her, which makes it seem like uh, she might have been the letter carrier. So Paul wrote this whole letter and then mentioned at the end that she was um, a, a great you know, worker, a great deacon, and that she should be accepted at the church. Um, what's interesting about this is a, another thing throughout the history of the church is that women have been excluded from some rule, roles in the church, leadership roles, and um, many people believe that women were not deacons in the, in the first century. But here it's very clear um, that Paul uses the word deacon to refer to Phoebe and recommends her. Now, you'll read some translations that will um, translate that word as a servant and not deacon, um, but it's the same exact word that's used in Acts when it's talking about the deacons in Acts. So um, if it is translated servant, it's because the people who are translating it had this preconceived idea that women weren't deacons in the first century. So be careful of those sorts of things. Um, mainly what the letter to the Romans is concerned about um, is the sinful human condition. You know, Paul sets it up and says, we are all sinners um, and we need salvation. And then he talks about God's solution um, to sin. And that is the fact that Jesus was sent to, to live and to be an example and to die. And uh, because of his death, we are justified. Um, we are um, reconciled back into relationship with God. So God, so Christ kind of provides that um, pulling back together of God and humans. Um, and the justification occurs when someone has faith in God. So if you have faith in God, then your faith justifies you um, and gives you a, a right relationship with God once again. He also talks about what that looks like afterwards. If you're going to follow Jesus, um, if you're justified by faith, then you can't just stop there. You can't just say, oh, I believe in Jesus and then live your life however you want. That's not um, what's going on here. The new life in Christ means, yes, we have freedom from the law. We don't have to follow all the um, many, many, many laws laid out in Leviticus. Um, but we do have to follow what Jesus said, and that is love your neighbor as yourself and love God. Um, so that's the new way of living um, in a way that is pleasing to God. Um, but this new life uh, does not just um, involve thinking or believing it also involves action um, and that we have to be people who sacrifice our lives um, that we have to be people who are good examples to those around us and we have to be people of love in all that we do so Paul wants to point that out as well um, and the last um, kind of section one of the very heavily debated sections in Romans is the section where Paul talks about Israel or, or the Jewish people and the church and what he does, he gives an analogy of an olive tree. And so we're going to look at this picture really fast before we finish. Um, so he says basically that there is a tree and the roots come from um, the Hebrew scripture and the relationship that God um, initiated with Abraham. And so Israel is, is part of God's plan, right? Well, when Jesus came, many people who were um, Jews did not accept him. And so it says that those branches of this tree were broken off. The unbelieving Israelites here are broken off. Now, the Gentiles then, the non-Jewish people, were grafted in as new branches. This is um, a horticultural metaphor where you can graft a branch from another wild olive tree or wild tree onto um, a tree. And so that's what happened because um, Jesus uh, opened up salvation to all people. Um, the Gentiles were able to come in and be in relationship with God. Um, and then you also have people who were Jewish people who um, stayed and believed in Jesus. So they're part of the original tree and they were not grafted on necessarily. They've always been there. Um, but the big question is what happens to these, to these branches that were broken off? And Paul doesn't give us a very clear answer, but it seems that he does believe that they will um, come to salvation in some way. Um, he doesn't explain it, um, but he says that this is all part of God's plan, that God is, has um, used Israel as a way to reach the world. Um, and even though people will not believe from Israel, that they will eventually come to understand Jesus as Messiah and come to follow God in this way. So it's an interesting analogy that he uses, and it's kind of confusing, so we don't know exactly what it means, but it is to help um, the Romans understand the relationship between the Jewish people um, and the new Christian church. Now we're about to be done. I just wanted to point out that we've been looking at these letters from Paul more in a chronological-ish <laughs> um, 
more in a chronological order than than anything. So um, we don't exactly know when all these were written. Oh.